detecting similar IDs uh, is a challenge that we have at Coinbase, and I'm going to talk to you a bit, a bit more in detail about that. Um, but just a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Burkai, and I've been at Coinbase for about two years. And I've been working on some identity-related um, products recently um, and worked on, worked on a few things uh, around account recovery using identity documents um, as well as um, using identity documents as different kinds of friction. So just a little bit about Coinbase first. Um, Everyone, I'm assuming everyone's familiar with Coinbase, but we're basically trying to make it very easy for um, our users to buy and sell and hold cryptocurrencies. And what we're trying to do is, you know, we're trying to basically do what the internet did back in the days for, for in terms of accessibility uh, into the financial system. So uh, we're trying to enable and build, build the Finance 2.0 infrastructure. So what does my team specifically do? I work for the risk and data team, which actually soups leads. Um, and what we do is we're, we're essentially trying to limit Coinbase's exposure to risk. So, and most of, the, most of the times what we're doing is, you know, we're trying to fight identity fraud. So uh, that's sort of like from our perspective, right? From, the Coinbase's, perspe from Coinbase's perspective, we're trying to mitigate risk against, against Coinbase. But we also do... Um, which is not part of this, this talk, but we also try to protect our users, so pr giving them you know, user security features. Um, so why, why try to detect similar IDs, right? Um, so I don't know if you've played this game, but find five differences. You, know, you have two pictures, and you're trying to find the differences. The, the answer is actually sort of shown here, but does anyone want to take a stab at what's different about these two IDs? Feel free to shout it out. Yeah, it's, it's a couple digits, right? It's, it's like, if you look at the driver's license, they actually, so this is a modified uh, driver's license, right? That we use for identity verification. Um, so what, what, the, what the fraudster did in this case, they modified the, the identity, uh, Basically, the driver's license number, it gets much more advanced than this, but this is a very subtle example. Uh, but we had around like 20 of these IDs with, with very, like the numbers switched around, right? Um, and, you know, they put, they put some work into that. Like, it's actually pretty good. Uh, and you could do some image forensics and things like that and try to, try to understand if the image is tempered. But usually, you know, like we're seeing attacks that are getting more and more complicated. Uh, so we need to do something a little, little better, trying to identify, you know, given two users submitting identities, how similar are they? And um, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and so I'm just going to tell you, like, the story of how we got to where we are right now with this problem. So just to give you a quick background, um, you know, the, our first attempt, we called it Shazam. And the inspiration for that was like audio fingerprinting, right? So um, much like audio fingerprinting, we're trying to fingerprint uh, identities, ide identity pictures. So like driver's licenses, passport photos, green cards, things like that. So what Shazam did was actually fairly simple. We, um, we wanted to fingerprint, like take some kind of hash of the, of the document, right? Uh, and Regular hashing algorithms wouldn't work too well for that because, like, intrinsically, their design is so that, you know, when you move, um, when you just modify a little bit of the image, you get huge changes. So you need some kind of perceptual hashing, right? And there is a good uh, open source uh, library for that called Blockhash. So we started out with that. So what it gives you is it gives you a 256-bit, uh, like, map of, of like, a, Basically, the, the claim is that whenever you use that mapping, 256-bit, and look at the Hamming distance for any two pictures, you'll get, like, the further you get uh, with the scores, the, the higher scores you get, the more different the IDs are. So closer IDs will have a similar hash. But, um, you know, quickly we realized, you know, there's a, 
there's uh, you know, some pros. Like it's actually fairly good on small data sets. Um, and it works really well with like cropping and some color changes. Uh, and it's very easy to implement. But we get some issues when you get into more like harder territory where you know, images are twisted and, and there's some Photoshopping going on. And once you have 256 bits is like not super high. So once you have large data sets, uh, this, this method started not working. And the domain specificity is like, you know, if we're dealing with faces and there's a lot, there's a lot of things going on with faces uh, that you know, this model is not able to pick on. Uh, so our second attempt was, we called it vision. Uh, so what this did is, you know, basically trying to uh, take a image recognition deep, deep uh, network and then trying to strip away the, the last like fully connected layer and then come up with a 4096 sort of uh, length feature. Uh, so <clears throat> we take that feature and then now we can build, like just treat that as like the, sim very much like the uh, perceptual hash that was 256 bit. Now we have this like super, like a lot higher entropy, which is more relevant um, vector, and we can do our comparisons against that. So whenever a new new user comes in with a new picture, we can we can check the most similar pictures and, and alert our fraud analyst uh, if there's something super close. Um, and it's it's very resilient against cropping and translation, but you know again still not domain specific. Like we're still using, you know, like initially we started using image classification, so which gives like a really good image classification networks, which gives like really good low level features, but it's not really like still not face specific, right? So we have to sort of, you know, we only did the first part of transfer learning where like, you know, we take a complicated network, but we haven't done the second part where like, you know, it, training it on like the domain that we wanted to operate on. So that's where, you know, we sort of, got into even further problems like with, with uh, images because like images are highly sensitive, they're personally identifiable. So now you have like a new challenge where you know you have this super highly secure environment and, and you don't have your image set accessible to you uh, very easily. So we had to build a whole new system in terms of you know um, dockerizing our, our models and, and be able to interpret you know these encrypted images. Uh, and, and the way we did that, did that is, you know, we use SageMaker, and now we can like parallelize these jobs, pulling these um, very highly secure images one by one, and like making sure they're encrypted at rest, and then um, and then we can operate on them locally, uh, you, like in the cloud through through SageMaker. And we have a simple CLI that we call Nostradamus. We can interact with those training jobs a lot a lot easier in a secure way. And while doing this, you know, we solved this huge security problem, but we also came up with like a very good way of versioning and modeling our, our models. And we're, we're using the system not only for deep learning on, on images, but also for all of our, our models. So some takeaways, you know, uh, we've, we've noticed that, you know, it's very important to start with a naive implementation which is like sort of our attempt one, and then build up from there for the more, more complicated solutions. It gave us a lot of speed for our iteration. And um, finally, you know, these attacks are getting very complicated. And, you know, I want to finish with the thought, like we, we have not addressed adversarial attacks yet, but this is something like, because the, of the accessibility of these models, it's, it's very easy to actually like build your own um, you know, adversarial networks and generate fake identities. And like, we still need to, you know, think about and how to sol solve these problems of, of fake generated identities. So that's it for my talk. And this, if, you, if you think any of this is interesting, uh, feel free to reach me out at my email down there. Thanks a lot. <laughs>